something happened. Welcome to SHE, where we explore and discuss social health and environmental issues. I'm your host, Norma Palin. Today, my guest is Nancy Skinner. Nancy is running for the uh, U.S. Congress in the 9th District. Nancy, welcome to SHE. Thank you, Norma. Good to be here. It's so nice to have you. Um, before we get started into the, some major issues that uh, I know we're going to discuss today, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, gladly. Thank you. <laughs> I'm from Royal Oak, uh, Michigan. So uh, I'm local. It's funny. My uh, opponent, Joe Nolenberg, in the, the last campaign, I ran in the last uh, election last November, came within a few points of beating uh, yes, the incumbent. Did. It was 47-51, so very close. And I was outspent 7-1 to one in that race and still almost beat my opponent. Uh, but grew up in Royal Oak and went to you know, Catholic school, Bishop Foley, University of Michigan, six brothers and sisters. My dad was a coach at Birmingham City Home. Yet one of the main attacks in his campaign is that it was a carpetbagger. So I laughed because I flew in at my, you know, six kids and two, my, both my parents just so I could run in this district is, is one of my jokes. But I went to University of Michigan Business School. I have a degree in finance. And The key is, Norma, and I know you share this passion on the environment, um, for me it was a personal experience. It was my sister-in-law who passed away from melanoma skin cancer, and she was 34 years old. So uh, I decided I was going to use my business degree to help advance alternative energy, renewable energy, those things that are causing global warming, uh, and that's really what it's going to require is a, is a whole sale shift to those massive technologies. So that sort of began this odyssey. I, worked uh, in a lot of different capacities and my favorite story is that I was a private citizen during the floods of 1993, those great Midwestern floods and many homes were getting washed down the river, you'll probably recall, yes, it was $16 billion in damage and I called my dad and said, Dad, you know, we should be rebuilding these communities as models of environmental sustainability with all the technology that we, not, we have and have had for a long time to show the rest of the world it can be done and we're going to spend the money anyways, we should be doing this. He said, great, Nance, what are you going to do? Call the White House? Said, yeah, I'm going to call the White House. I, and I did. I picked up the phone. I called the White House. I got bounced around for two weeks. Finally, I found myself at the White House, sitting around one of those big tables with 10 federal agencies representing, saying, that's a really good idea. Let's do it. So we brought in uh, the dream team of architects and engineers from all over the country. We chose two model towns, a little town called Valmire, Illinois, and Pattonsburg, Missouri. And we rebuilt them off the floodplain, of course, so it would never happen again as models of environmental sustainability. And oddly enough, the book that got me started was Al Gore's book, Earth in the Balance. His first book is why I really felt strongly that I wanted to do this. So I, um, we went back and we all received an award, a presidential award for our work from Al Gore. So it kind of came full circle. And then um, after so many years, I said, we need to, we really, this issue of global warming, the science was, was in on it for 10 years but the industry had been leading a disinformation campaign about it. So I said, we need to get our voices out on radio and talk to the American public and, and sort of penetrate that. And I said to a friend, I need to get on a, a talk radio show and, and go up against these guys like Rush Limbaugh. And my friend says, you can't just get a radio show. You know, you got to work in Podunk, Iowa. Well, I did. I got a radio show in the third largest talk station in America, went nationally syndicated started doing a lot of uh, commentating on national TV programs, including Fox News. There was a Democratic commentator out there. And, and it was probably the best training for what it is that I do, you know, at this point. We, I believe, 
that we as me as a Democrat, we need people out there that know all these issues. I've been debating them now for 10 years in on national television, on national radio, with the best and the brightest, can get my point of view out there quickly, uh, understand that so much of this is about spin uh, and how things are spun. Right. And, and really that affects public opinion, which affects action and, and laws and our lawmakers. And then at some point, finally people said, you just got to run for office. You have to be in Congress and enact those laws. And so uh, I did. My first run, I was talking to running Didn't for... Didn't you run against Obama? Yeah, I was talking to a guy who had no chance of winning because his name uh, polled uh, like a terrorist, is what they said at the time, and 3% uh, name rec recognition. He and I got to be very good friends on the campaign trail. He called me when he came back to Michigan, when I came back, and endorsed me heartily, uh, called me the sharpest opponent in his race. I'm, I'm so thrilled to see him at this presidential, right. you know, the, po the prospect of, of my buddy being president of the United States. So, and then I, I, had, I moved home. I was on 1310 AM here in, in uh, Farmington Hills, the Detroit's Progressive Talk for a year. Talked into running one more time against Joe Nolenberg. There you go, almost beat him. A year later, I'm back at it. Well, you what know, a story, it, huh? It's quite a story. And and I was going to ask you about that. Why in the world did you come back uh, again? And now I know it's that passion, it's that drive, and, and good for you because that's exactly what we need in uh, in politics today. Is somebody that has something that they truly believe in, and they're willing to keep, you know, fighting and fighting and fighting to get the word out. Yeah, it's that. And you know, I think as I talk to people all over uh, our area. There is a certain, there's a disillusionment with the whole establishment right now. Yeah, money uh, has overtaken politics, and people do not feel like their interests are being represented. That it's the corporate donors and the big donors and the party establishment who pick and choose in the back rooms. And there's this frustration with the situation in Iraq. The Democrats, we did take the majority. I wish I were there to be, you know, with them. I was this close. But people don't sense that there's been progress, that even the leadership has been, um, in my view, they're fearful of being outspun by President Bush, that somehow right. he'll say, as he tried to do in a press conference recently, that they're against the troops if they don't fund this war in Iraq. And so I don't understand why there is this constant fear. You do the right thing. You vote your conscience. And if you're thrown out of office for it, so be it. And if we had more people in Congress, that would vote their conscience and not stop doing this with the polls right away in the re-election prospects, and that's Democrats as well as Republicans, right. then I think we would have so much more progress on these issues at the time frame of which is critical. Global warming, something that has been my driving passion. Now reports coming out saying we have about a five to seven year window. In fact, the international community came out and said if we don't have a plan in place by 2009, then the worst of these uh, of these consequences will be very difficult to mitigate, if impossible. And we're talking about Greenland and Western Antarctica melting, which would rise the sea level uh, rise of something like 40 feet. You're getting you're talking about infestation. You're talking about agricultural losses. These this is the most serious crisis facing humanity. So Nancy, what's the solution? There's good news. We can deal with global warming. Lots of companies, major companies, have now come to the conclusion, including Ford Motor Company, a lot of the big power companies, even some of the oil companies, petroleum for the most part, that this we have to deal with this. So it's technology, Norma. We have, we're America, okay? We have the ability to invent the, the technology that will, alternative energy, renewable energy, that, that will lead us out. And in the same time, produce good jobs here at home. So, uh, for instance, this is something near and dear to our, uh, you know, obviously the auto industry. I was reading yesterday that Honda will begin leasing a fuel cell vehicle in 2008 to people that will get effectively 68 miles to the gallon next year. Where are we? Exactly. <laughs> we need to be much further ahead and then building that infrastructure for hydrogen uh, as well as um, at-home charging stations so that we can use plug-in electric hybrid vehicles vastly increase our mileage, and it, this technology will spread all across various sectors. It's not just automotive, but building technology. We, we know how to insulate buildings so that you reduce your mechanical systems and use half as much energy. They do in Japan right now and in Germany. It's a matter of the political will and leadership to get the incentives in the right place and make this happen. 
And that's why I believe we need strong progressive leaders that are going to do what's right regardless of their campaign contributors and, and put our country back on the track. Now, for a national security reason as well, because we are so dependent on oil from an insecure region. This is, it's about global warming, but also this keeps us, this oil dependency keeps us trapped in a very uh, hostile land as we've seen with, with Iraq. Right. We would not be in Iraq if we were not so dependent on the oil. And lots of people that have now come out of the Bush administration have said as much that, uh, including Alan Greenspan, that Iraq right. was definitely about oil. And so, and that brings me to just one more issue, Iraq. If we had more leaders with courage who would have spoken up before that run-up to the war, because now we know that there was a lot of good information. I was on my radio and television program challenging pro-war Congress people, asking tough questions, and had more of us stood up at that time and asked those questions and stopped this rush to war, I don't believe we would have gone into Iraq. And now we're seeing the same kind of drumbeat with Iran. And right. what came out for the National Intelligence Report saying, you know, President Bush was talking about World War III. Guess what? We've known for a long time now that they stopped their nuclear production program back in 2003. We need leaders with courage and guts right now to do what's right. Well, speaking of Iran obvi or Iraq, obviously that is a key, key issue right now, and it's a key um, political issue. What are your thoughts on Iraq? Well, we, you know, we've been there now. We've been there five years. And so uh, the, it's funny because I, I believe we were led into this war based on a pack of lies. We, we, the, it's been well documented. Bob Woodward and, and President, uh, President Gore, Vice President Al Gore in his most recent book, <laughs> <laughs> Just a Freudian slip. That's all right. They were all false assumptions, and we now know that. So it's the, like the fruit of the poison tree is a legal theory. So uh, how can we say it was weapons of mass destruction which weren't found, and then it was the liberation of the Iraqi people, so they are liberated. Then it was fighting al-Qaeda. Now it's a civil war. Now it's about national reconciliation. We, we don't even know what the mission is. You know, I believed in Colin Powell's uh, Powell Doctrine. You have to have a clearly defined mission, overwhelming force, and an exit strategy. And we have had none of those. So at this point, we have to get out of Iraq. It's costing us $20 billion a month or more to be there. Money, the corruption is rampant, uh, and it's getting wasted money that we need to be spending here. And this idea that I know it's politically expedient to say it'll take us 18 months. My opponent in the primary says 18 months to get out of Iraq. From a military standpoint, that's not even correct, because who wants, if the mission does not change, you're, you're, the troops are going to be vulnerable as Fewer of them are there to carry out that mission. So we need to change the mission. I believe in, in uh, Congressman Murtha's plan about relocating, redeploying troops to the periphery. Uh, Senator Russ Feingold has a bill out that would get our troops out within six months uh, and stabilize that region and start to you know, reduce our oil dependence. Imagine if we put, took $20 million, what we spent in Iraq for one month, and had that invested in Detroit. So $20 million, what that would do to, to start to jump frog technologies, alternative energy, like fuel cells, hybrids, $20 billion, this most recent legislation that's being debated, there's scant uh, incentives, no tax breaks uh, at all, at some point in the future perhaps a little bit. Why shouldn't we make the national security case that Detroit should get $20 billion because that's the greatest way to reduce our oil dependence and never need to go back into those And look at the again. jobs we would be creating as well, correct? Which is obviously a key issue in Michigan and throughout the United States. It, uh, running the gamut of technology, you know, there's a backlog on wind turbines because we don't have enough manufacturing facilities and we have idle plants here in Michigan. Uh, you have geothermal, wind, uh, wave energy. There is so much, but it's going to take leadership. We don't even have a portfolio standard here in Michigan that's requiring a certain percentage. Those, those policies are what create jobs, and they're not jobs that are easily shipped to China. And that's important too, as we've seen recently. Yes. Our trade agreements are a mess. What, we, what, what all the free traders don't take into consideration is that we here in America have this kind of living standard, and in, with six billion people on the planet, they have a much lower standard, and they're willing to work for uh, below uh, a living wage, far below poverty wages, we can't compete with that. That's There's right. no, I, and I love, I love politicians who get out there and say, well, it, we, our workers are the best in the world, and we can compete with them at any level. You can't compete when, when they're making, you know, cents 
uh, an hour and you know we are living a certain standard of life there has to be we have to completely restructure those trade agreements so that the, those corporations and those countries have an incentive to provide a living wage so it's a race to the top not a race to the bottom and very few candidates ever get into the nuts and bolts of of how we do that I've laid that plan out that we actually go to uh, our trade agreements and we um, penalize countries that don't pay the right their tariff is is higher so if you are paying your workers a living wage in that country of course is monitored by NGOs you get a preferential tariff so there's an incentive to fix right, this system right. and we made these trade laws God didn't hand them down there are trade laws we can go in and we can fix them now Nancy as uh, I'm a consumer and, and this is the Christmas holiday, and I've been out there trying to buy my family and my pets, my animals, some products, and you know, some, some gifts for Christmas, and I am, I don't know what to do. I mean, with all the recalls lately and all the products, you know, it, it's, it's, it's frightening. And we, I believe we, we have got to get these jobs back in the United States. We have got to have the standards over there as well as over here. And who is, who is going to make sure that we're safe? Well, that fits into the whole restructuring of trade laws. And China right now, the products that we've been talking about with the lead in Chinese products, it's coming to the Americans' attention. But I'll tell you, when it comes to a whole vast uh, another area, agricultural production, nobody has a clue. There, there is no labeling of, of food products coming into this country now. So we've banned uh, uh, DTE, we've banned uh, different dioxins but they haven't in other countries and there's no labeling requirement so you're shopping at a grocery store and you have no idea whether a toxin that is a proven carcinogen in America is in your food supply uh, and our food supply is dangerous the products are dangerous because we don't have these homogenized standards there are different environmental health safety standards all over the world right. and we have to bring those up to par drugs the whole, the whole thing uh, and you know what the bottom line always comes back to this those people who are funding campaigns they don't want labeling of these products the big corporate interests fund politicians who get into office because it's going to take for me to run for office realistically it's it's going to be three million dollars three to five and this time around could be up as high as seven million dollars so the average person and god bless them that give me ten twenty five dollars to run and I'm getting contributions from four, up to 40 states now for people Good that for you. believe in this but to compete at that level when you have companies that are bundling this kind of money do you really think that they are giving politicians money because it's altruism they're getting a huge payback these defense contractors the Halliburton's of the world the, and the policies that, that they support that are so lucrative we all pay the cost so if people ask me like if there was one magic wand and we could fix our system or begin, what would it be? It would have to be public financing. And I have long maintained that as, so, as long as private interests are funding the campaigns, private interests are served. When the public starts funding campaigns, the public interest can be served because those people will not be beholden to their, to their campaign. I'm in total agreement with you. I mean, I absolutely believe that's the way we have to go. Yeah, and I think probably the majority of the people were willing you know whereas each candidate they're playing on a level playing field you know you all have the same amount of funding and then you should get free air time you know for your media and uh, you're right that's the way to go and I think that's where our founding fathers would if, if I think our, our founding fathers would have seen this system where it's all about money and factions and wealthy interest essentially pilfering the Treasury we have a nine trillion dollar debt that we are all going to pay for the you know, Alan Greenspan in his book, he's come out and sounded the warning bells, the deficit spending in the Bush administration. So many Republicans support me. I'm a finance major and a fiscal conservative, really, which I think has become an oxymoron <laughs> given the spending of this, this group. But, sure. but they're getting so much that our children will have to pay for it. We will have to pay that um, many, many times over. Nancy, what's the difference? I know um, uh, Gary Peters is running against you in the primary. What, tell us uh, where you feel that uh, the difference between you and Gary. 
Well, you know, that's democracy. Anybody can run for office. I came within a few points, and I think yes, there was she a did. reason it was very, very close. It really, people thought I didn't have a chance. They called it a suicide mission. I was outspent seven to one. But I believe that I have this passion. I worked hard. We had a great team. We went door to door. I, you know, spoke to people about values and their concepts and, and how we can uh, change this country if we really invest in the right people. Um, I think, again, that, that so much of the establishment is about polling and, and you know, issues. I know that uh, we were both asked to speak at an Iraq forum, Gary Peters and myself, uh, on our position, position. Congressman Conyers got up and spoke. I, of course, got up and spoke my mind, um, and, and Gary Peters sat in the audience, declined to speak. I don't think we need people sitting in the audience. <laughs> I think we need people who are going to stand up and, you know, and he may have had his reasons why he didn't want to get out there. I, you know, I think he's a good guy with a good resume and, a, you know, that. But I don't think people elect resumes. They elect people. And we, at this juncture in our country, need people who can communicate and articulate, go to Washington and not be a follower, because it takes courage to be against the war in Iraq. At the time, I was. Now, it's 75% of the people are saying, okay, they're against it. So a lot of you know, people are following the polls. But we need leaders to take the, the tough stand. And, and people are going to have to decide. One more thing, um, Norma, I will say this. We have 15 members of our delegation in, in Michigan. We only have two women. So I, we're 53% of the electorate. I firmly believe that we need more women in Washington because when we do, the issues we care about, health care, another important issue, so many of those issues, the environment, get a greater voice than without us. And so when you have a woman who almost, who almost won, who has got a great background and worked hard, you know, I, I hope people will support me. But this is democracy, and everyone has a right to run and make their case. If, if you uh, win, when you become, you know, a uh, U.S. Congresswoman, what are some of the... You're, I know we talked about global warming, but what do you think is, the, outside of global warming, what is the key, key issues we need to be, uh, what, what's some of the first things you would have on your agenda? Well, I think, you know, the economy right now, we have the foreclosure crisis. It, there's not enough attention being paid to this. There will be upwards of two million uh, reset mortgages next year. And that has a spiraling effect. I was debating that on um, a national Fox News channel. They're imbalanced <laughs> because why should why should we look at a solution there? Because our everybody's property values they've dropped something like 14 percent nationally, uh, and it, they'll continue to drop if your neighbor forecloses on his home. So it's it's not right. you know doing good unto your brother is really doing good for yourself in this instance, and uh, so it fits into all of that. I believe what we do great in America is we invent things. So really looking at life sciences and, and alternative energy and then investing in those, interest, those industries strategically. And I, of course, will focus on Michigan as your congresswoman from Michigan because we have the capacity, we have the great intellectual uh, and uh, academic talent here to bring those research dollars home and make Michigan an alternative energy state, a life science state, um, and get the, get the economy healthy again. Then the bigger issues, obviously, reducing our oil dependence and fixing our trade laws are are uh, the biggest one. Healthcare, we didn't mention that, and that is so critical on all levels because it's a competitiveness issue. You know, some people will say, is it a moral issue? I believe it is. I believe it's a moral issue that we should, ha we should be able to provide health care for our citizens. But we have to find a way to uh, get that issue um, uh, to be politically uh, uh, electable, if you will. And, he and here's my plan. Instead of going overnight to universal health care, which, which is the ideal for a lot of people, because it, you can't get folks to give up their Blue Cross right. Blue Shield That's right. for the unknown government program. So it's, nev it's just not going to happen. So what we have to do is, um, I believe that the government should be allowed to compete with private health insurers to offer a low-cost, affordable policy and bring them into the system so everyone's insured. That brings the cost down for, for all of us and those savings will, will uh, accrue to all of us. Uh, you bring them into the, a tent, you prove that through Medicare, it's a great program for those folks, that they can get quality health care and we move closer and closer to a system that's fair, sane, and moral. And if you haven't seen Michael Moore's 
documentary. I have it. Mexico. No, I have not. Then watch it, and you'll okay. know what it's, it compares what's going on here to the rest of the world, and you look at that, and you say, people, 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 we can do better. Again, special interests have been fighting. Well, you know, I know. I, I'm paying for my, help, my own health care right now. My deductible is like $3,500. It's just, it's crazy. I am as and well. And then, all right, see, it, it is. It, it's, it's, it's sad. And then, you know, of course, you have people that, uh, you know, I, I know we, we don't want to get into, like, a lot of immigration or anything, but you got people that are coming in here that are getting some of that paid for, and those of us U.S. citizens, we're, we, we have a problem with that. Well, they're showing up in emergency rooms. We have a problem. You know, not that yeah, I don't want to help the rest of the world because I do. But I know, but the cost is bring it home to us. too. Absolutely. So that is why we need. This is a major issue, and I, I, a lot of people get caught up in the politics, the presidential politics, of the personalities. And I think what people have to keep in mind is that there is a difference, and I think that a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress are going to focus on these these. Um, domestic issues. They're going to move the, fo the ball forward. The Republicans, I, I am sorry, not, and, 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 and like the independents are, are getting this. The oil subsidies to huge oil companies that keep us locked in, you know, the, the, they have been willing to overlook that. So uh, everyone has their favorite candidate, you know, whether it's Hillary Clinton, I know Barack Obama, but I really want to see a woman, but I love Barack Obama. <laughs> I was going to ask you that, by the way. And I was going to say, where are you going with those? You know, and I think Todd Edwards also has a sincerity yes, I do too. That, he, that has come out in him. And uh, so I'm so thrilled with our field of candidates. But you know what? It's going to be nasty politics. It's all attack. We, we spend these, this, this, it's going to be a $2 billion spent on attack ads. There's something so wrong. My opponent, Joe Nolenberg, spent something like $3 million attacking me. Can you imagine what? You're trying to just do some good in the world, and you get up and watch your TV, and uh, of course you just, the liberal Nancy Skinner is going to raise your taxes, <laughs> something I've never <laughs> talked about. Um, the word liberal gets thrown at every Democrat, and of course yes. there's the conditioning of, oh, what's that, a liberal? Keep in mind, folks, you know, we need these things done in our country. And so as you get out there, get involved in the, pro the our process, get behind a candidate, give them 10 bucks, Go work the phones. It, we, it, it, this is not just about us as candidates. Right. I, I always I, I talk about my campaign as we all the time when I'm with my people. We did this. Because it is we. Yeah, I'm out in front, slings and arrows. I, I'm willing to take that. But it's, it's the big we, really. And the stakes are so high, the timetable for what we have to deal with in this world is so well, narrow. Nancy, tell our, our listeners how they can contact you and, and get more information. I know you have a website and that type of stuff. Yeah, sure. It's SkinnerForCongress.com. That's, that's easy. That's F-O-R, same, yeah, same as last time. Our phone number is 248-691-9161, uh, 248-691-9161. Um, and, and you can send me...